You can do it. You can do it. I encourage you, encourage you to do that. Some of you have mentioned that my PowerPoint background has been very difficult to look at uh, leading up to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is over. I hope now it's not a repulsive background uh, to look at, uh, but uh, appreciate you staying with us. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has, has been... Um, it's been a confusing topic, maybe, uh, to a lot of people, a misunderstood uh, person, if you will. There's been a lot of confusion, I think, around God's Spirit. Who is He exactly? How does He work? How is He still active in my life today? What benefit is God's Holy Spirit to me? I'm not going to pretend to know everything about God's Spirit, and I'm not going to... Uh, cause you to think that all of that's going to be cleared up today with this lesson, but my goal is that you do have a better understanding of God's Spirit after this morning and how exactly He is, is at work in your life presently, even today. I think the Holy Spirit, at least in my study and, and just listening to people, has mis, been mischaracterized in a lot of ways. Uh, the God's Spirit has been described as an impersonal, active source or force of energy, which I believe to be untrue, biblically speaking. Unfortunately, at least in my opinion, in the King James Version, the Spirit has been translated as or called the Holy Ghost. I don't believe the Spirit is a ghost, at least in the way that we uh, a lot of people nowadays believe ghosts to be or, or things of, of that nature. Uh, but the proper translation to understand is that God's Spirit is holy and is a holy Spirit. And as we look throughout Scripture, the Spirit reveals Himself as having all the characteristics of deity. That He is divine. He is part of what we have termed the Godhead. He Himself is God and has those characteristics. As we look throughout Scripture, we see that and that he has described himself that way. He has the, the characteristics of deity. He is eternal. Hebrews 9 and verse 14, as the Hebrew writer is talking about uh, the blood of Jesus, he's talking about there the blood of bulls and goats, and here's what he says. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The work of the Holy Spirit is not bound by time. He's not bound by time. He was at work in the past, in the present, and in the future. He is at work within us right now. And even 20 centuries removed from the work of the cross, he is still working at and applying the blood of Jesus Christ to us and forgiving our sins. The Spirit is all-knowing. Paul says, No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. The Spirit knows all things and is at work revealing to us through the Word of God, the very thoughts of God and the wishes, the desires of what God wants us to know. He knows the very numbers of hairs on our head and the ones we've lost as well. Glenn, I, I, I appreciate a well-timed joke. <laughs> the Spirit is all-knowing. He knows our hearts right now. He knows why you're here. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you need to give to God. The Spirit is all-knowing. The Spirit of God is also ever-present. David says, he asked the question, where shall I go from your Spirit? Psalm 139. He is invisible. And sometimes, at least to us, he seems to be imperceptible. Like we, we can't, although we can't see him, sometimes we can't feel him ever uh, some, uh, at, at times. And we wonder, where is God? But he's always there. For some... This may seem terrifying. For us who are children of God, this is very comforting. To know that God will never leave us nor forsake us. 
and that His Spirit is always with us. One aspect I like about the Spirit is that He illuminates our understanding of spiritual things. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of God who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. The Bible tells us that the wisdom of God to the world seems foolish. But to those who possess the Spirit of God, we have the ability to understand why God has asked us to live a certain way. Why he has asked us to do certain things. To the world it doesn't make sense, but to us we see the wisdom of God at work because we have the Spirit and he works to illuminate us and helps us understand and perceive and then live out spiritual things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I'm thankful for the Spirit of God and I know you are as well. Even though you may not quite understand or comprehend how he's at work in your life, I hope you have a better understanding of that today. When you open your Bible, it doesn't take long before you find the Spirit. Just 16 words into the Hebrew Bible, the Spirit of God makes an appearance. And perhaps depending on which English translation you use, it's around 29 words uh, into the English Bible that the Spirit makes an appearance. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the land and the skies. And the earth was without form and void. That's the idea that it was disordered and uninhabitable. And darkness was over the face of the deep. Now listen to this. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Here's a picture of the disordered and uninhabited world. It's dark and it's chaotic and poised over the top of the chaos. We find the Spirit of God. And He's in control of the chaos. And He's at work ready to bring about order and beauty and life out of the chaos. The word that we find for Spirit here is ruach. And it means wind or breath or spirit. And Tim Mackey says this, just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Job said, as long as my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils, Job 27 and verse 3. Genesis 2 and verse 7 says very, something very similar to that. It says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or the ruach of life. And the man became a living being. Every breath you have taken to this point in your life, even this moment, as you are breathing in, you are breathing in a gift of the Spirit. You're not breathing in the Spirit. You already have the Spirit. You're breathing in a gift of the Spirit, the gift of life. And He's sustaining your life physically and spiritually at this very moment. As we continue in Scripture, what we find out is, or what we see is, the Spirit of God empowering people for specific tasks the very first one is the man by the name of joseph remember the ability that god gave him to interpret dreams pharaoh said to his servants can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of god then pharaoh said to joseph since god has shown you all this there is none so discerning and wise as you are, Genesis 41. So here we see the Spirit of God at work in the life of Joseph, helping him interpret these dreams. And before we keep moving, I find it very interesting, just a little bit on a side note here, as the children of Israel leave Egypt and they are ready to cross the Red Sea, Exodus 14 and verse 21 says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east, remember, wind, or ruach, all night, and made the sea uh, dry land, and the waters were divided. 
Interestingly enough, Isaiah 63 and verse 11 attributes that work to the Holy Spirit of God. The next person we see empowered by the Spirit to a specific task is an obscure gentleman by the name of Bezalel. The Lord told Moses this, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting and carving wood to work in every craft. Exodus 31. He's the one that God empowered by the Spirit to help begin to design and build and put together the tabernacle. And he did so by the Spirit of God. As we keep going in Scripture, we get to a group of men called the prophets. And we see that the the, the Spirit of God was at work empowering the prophets to go to the people of Israel and rebuke them because of their sin and the hardness of heart and the injustices that were caused by that. And one of those prophets in particular, by the name of Ezekiel, says this, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. God's talking about a time that will come that he will renew his, his people by putting his spirit within them. And empowering them to live a new life. As we continue in scripture, we come to the New Testament. And we are introduced to Jesus And when Jesus is baptized by John, he comes up out of the water. We're told that the heavens open up and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And to all my Bible bold people, that happens in Matthew, where? Three, very good. Okay, I'm seeing some fingers up here. That's good. Matthew chapter three. And the Spirit then empowers Jesus to begin his ministry as he goes out into the the people and he begins to reverse the effects of sin as he's healing people and forgiving their sins. The religious leaders do not like this, so they devise a plan and they put Jesus to death. But three days later, he's resurrected from the dead by the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8. And he's the first fruits of of new creation, 1 Corinthians 15. And after his resurrection and then his ascension into heaven, the Spirit, uh, Jesus sends the Spirit to the twelve, and they are filled with the Spirit. They begin to speak in tongues, and they preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and its power to save. And the people are convicted by their sin of killing Jesus, and they want to know what do we do. And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. It's in Jesus that we receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit, and we become new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 We individually and we collectively become shared sacred space as the place where God dwells on earth through His Spirit, His Holy Spirit. And as we live in submission to the will of God's Spirit, He empowers us and transforms us and He produces His fruit in us of love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control so that we can love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as ourself. It's interesting to note as you go through the Gospels and you see the plan of human redemption unfold that the Spirit is there the whole time playing a very distinctive role role in human redemption. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Luke chapter 1, we see 
that uh, the Spirit comes, uh, or not the Spirit, but an angel comes to Mary and says that she will have a child and what is in her will be conceived by the Spirit of God. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, as he's baptized by John, we see the Spirit come down and, and uh, descend upon him and empower him. Even throughout all of Jesus' ministry, we're told in Acts 10 and verse 38, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power, so he went about doing good. Jesus' death on the cross, he is led there by the Spirit. Speaking of, of uh, that, he says, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God. And at the resurrection, we see the Spirit. Jesus is resurrected by the Spirit of God. At Pentecost, we've already gone over some of this, the Holy Spirit is given to the apostles. as They preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then the people respond, and they're baptized in Christ, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's there all the time working as the plan of human redemption unfolds. And he's still with us today. He's within us personally, and he's here with us collectively, guiding our hearts and our minds as we offer praise and worship to God. I'm thankful for the Spirit of God. I'm thankful for the Spirit of God for several reasons. Um, but as we look, I'm thankful for the Spirit of God because He has revealed to us the Word of God. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We're told, 2 Timothy 2, and verse, uh, or chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is... God breathed or breathed out by God. That word is connected to the Greek word for spirit. And there's a reason for that. Because it's been written down and breathed out through the spirit of God. And now, because of it, we know the mind of God. I know the will of God. I don't pretend to know what God is thinking. I know what God is thinking because I can open up his word and read it and study it and apply it to my life and live it out and know that I'm living a life well-pleasing to God. Not based on my work or anything that I've come up with, but because I have the word of God. The Spirit has revealed it to me. And I'm thankful to the men who have written it down and have preserved it with their life so that even you and I have multiple copies of it today. The Spirit was the one actively involved in the process of revealing and protecting the Word of God for us today. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the Spirit of God because the Spirit helps me when I'm weak and He prays for me. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. It's not that we don't know how to pray. Jesus has given us an example. We know how to pray, but there are times where the emotions that we feel are so overwhelming and feel so deep that we don't have the words to express what we are feeling or what we want to say to God as we pray. And it's in those times that the Spirit takes those inadequate words or those unutterable expressions before the throne of God and He expresses them. To God. I don't know exactly how that works, but I've had um, an example given to me, and it stuck with me. And I'm going I'm to pass it along to you. This may be somehow of how the, at least uh, that my mind can comprehend, of how the Spirit takes these words or these feelings and expresses them to God. Imagine with me that a young child has gone out and has picked 
their, his mom a bouquet of, of wild flowers. And he's picked this flower and that flower and, and he's put them together. And before he takes this bouquet of flowers that has beautiful flowers, but maybe some weeds and some broken flowers or stems and some dirt and some of the root, ball, root balls that are, are still there. This messy kind of ugly but beautiful bouquet is about to give it to his mom. And before he does... An older, a little wiser, more discerning sibling comes and says, let me help you. And they takes that bouquet of flowers and takes out the weeds or maybe the ones that mom is allergic to and uh, cuts the dirt, the root balls, balls off and uh, removes the, the, maybe the bugs that, that are in that bouquet and, and pours some water into a vase and puts those now beautiful, well-arranged flowers into that vase so they can present it now to the mom. I think that's sort of what the Spirit does with our words. Those words that that I'm feeling that I can't express and don't know how to say them and offer them to the Father, the the Spirit takes those feelings and those thoughts and those words and expresses them to the Father. I'm thankful for the Spirit because He helps me when I'm weak and prays for me and intercedes on my behalf. But I'm thankful for the Spirit because He empowers me to comprehend the spiritual and live it out. Look at Galatians chapter 5. As Paul here begins to talk about the Spirit and uh, the works of the Spirit and and the works of, of the flesh, he says in verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Um... For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is a battle within us every day. And you know that. You know you have the desire to live for self. But you know within you there is also that deep desire and wanting to do what God wants you to do. That's your spirit and that's the, uh, the Holy Spirit at work. At battle. At odds with one another. To battling it out. And the Spirit wants you so badly to live for God and do what God wants you to do. And if you submit yourself to that Spirit, He will renew you and empower you and give you the ability to love others, even your enemies. And then... Joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. He empowers you to comprehend those things and live them out that they bear fruit in your life even when things aren't going the way you want them to go or think they ought to go or there's trouble in your life or whatever you're facing. You can still live out and bear the fruit of the Spirit because He lives within you. You can comprehend that and live it out. I'm thankful for the Spirit because He empowers me to comprehend the spiritual and live it out. But I'm also thankful for the Spirit because He marks me. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I love what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. He says, in him, speaking of Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. When I'm immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins, something beautiful and wonderful and mysterious, and I say mysterious because I can't explain how it happens. God gives you His Spirit. He pours His Spirit into your heart. And it's His Spirit that bears witness with my spirit that I belong to God, that I'm a child of God. Have you ever wondered what will happen when Jesus returns and we all stand before Him? To some people, that's terrifying. It shouldn't be that way. Because those of us who possess the Spirit 
of God, as we stand before the Lord, we have nothing to worry about because the Lord knows who belongs to him. He knows who are his, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. And because we have been given the Spirit of God as a guarantee, not as a maybe so, but as a guarantee of our inheritance that we have something far better waiting for us after this life as I stand before the Lord. It is my spirit that will bear witness that I belong to him and that I'm his. And when that day comes, I will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What a day that will be. I'm thankful. I'm so thankful for the Spirit. And I hope after this morning that your gratitude for the gift that you have been given, the gift of God that dwells within you, that it is much more appreciated than ever before. Do you have the Spirit of God? If not, God doesn't know who you are. You don't belong to him, and you are without hope. This morning, in response to the invitation, you can obey the gospel by repenting of your sins, being immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and receiving the gift of the Spirit to live within you and to guide you as long as you walk by the Spirit, submitting yourself to him. He will guide you into all truth. He will help you bear, or he will cause you to bear love, joy, and peace and the fruit of the Spirit that no matter what is going on in your life, you can offer thanksgiving and gratitude and praise and worship to God because you are a child of God. If you're already a child of God this morning, Maybe by, because of the way that you've been living your life, you've been grieving the Holy Spirit of God. You can make things right with God this morning. And He's just and He's faithful to forgive you of your sins. Whatever your need is, please make it known and come forward while we stand and while we sing.